uh, gosh, it was over a year ago, so I'd have trouble digging it up, where somebody said, if, if only people knew that the internet was held together by midnight sessions of Cheetos and Dr. Pepper. Um, I mean, really, the whole internet, we scramble around all the time, and that's the only thing that keeps it up. So it's unreliable to some and reliable to others. So reliability is subjective, and reliability requires somebody to perceive whether or not they trust the software, right? So for you to make reliable software, you gotta think about who it is that's trusting the software and whether or not you're making trustworthy stuff, right? Now this talk isn't gonna stay architecture. <laughs> We're gonna get right down into how to make reliable REST distributed systems. But first we gotta agree on what reliability is and we can tell we did or did not make a reliable system if people do actually trust it. That's what I would like, I would like to raise the bar there. It doesn't matter how many nines you have, it matters if people trust your stuff. That's it. <laughs> that makes reliable software. And the people that need to use it are one audience that need to trust it and the people who need to manage and maintain it are the other group. Because if they don't trust it, it's not reliable anyway. All right, so this is what ISO 9126 says reliability is. I'll read it to you. A set of attributes that bear on the capability of software to maintain its level of performance under stated conditions for a stated period of time. Does it look like it was written by a lawyer? <laughs> ISO 9126. This is the software quality ISO standard. This is the, what says, here's what we all agree reliability is, except nobody in this room thinks of this when it's time to talk about reliable software. Sure, it, it seems to fit. It seems to rule out maintainability and performance and some of the other things. But in the end, we, we don't really use this, this definition. But I did take from the ISO 9126 definition of reliability four qualities that I thought were useful. Maturity, fault tolerance, recoverability, recoverability, and reliability compliance. And this talk doesn't have time to go through all of them. So let's just talk about the middle two. So what's fault tolerance? What do we do when something breaks? How well does our system work? And how did, that seems like, to some, it, it might seem like a contradiction. How can our system work when it's broken, right? Well, that's because systems are made up of many parts, right? And in order for me to do my job, in order for the subway guy to give you a sub, then the truck has to bring the roast beef. And if the truck didn't bring the roast beef, you can't order a roast beef sub, right? Too bad, I showed up at work at eight o'clock in the morning and I can't sell roast beef sandwiches. I don't trust Subway anymore, right? It doesn't matter if it's your truck, right? So what do they do? They throw a bunch of roast beef in the freezer, right? They have, they have redundancy. That's one way to do fault tolerance, right? What's recoverability? And how is that different? I highlighted it because I think these are the two areas where we can, we can use the set of tools I'm gonna to show you <laughs> to make your software more reliable. Fault tolerance is what the system does right now when there's a problem, I think, and re recoverability is what we do to fix it so there's no more problem. <laughs> It's how well can we fix it? So one of them is the car doesn't break down. The other one's does it have a hood and is it easy to get to the oil pump and all that? Is it easy to get in and out of? So recoverability uh, is sort of the operations version of maintainability if you think about it. How well can somebody take care of it? How well can we as a group get the system back up and running? Sometimes it'll even do self-healing but we had to program that. <laughs> We're gonna see some of that later. The other two matter too but we don't have time to cover all of them. I'm gonna give you a much better definition um, shortly. This is the problem with most distributed software, is whoever's writing the software, it's either gonna be somebody else's fault that they're calling or the user's gonna handle it. That's every time you throw an exception, <laughs> right? It's either, oh well, I can't help it, Amazon S3's down, I'm down. Go to my status page, I'll let you know when I'm back up. Or it's, I don't know what the problem is here, and chuck a stack trace up, right? <laughs> and give it, to give it to your consumer. Most of the time, the reason our software is unreliable is we don't think about the layer we're on and what we're gonna be responsible for and what we're going to pass along. There's an abstraction for failure that needs to happen. So this is, uh, this is Mark Twain explaining that for humans. <laughs> it's always easy to change the other guy's habits than yours, right? So reliability in the case of distributed systems is harder than in a single system. What's a distributed system? What makes it different than like a circulatory system or a solar system? <laughs> yeah. 
Is the solar system distributed? <laughs> Lots of points of failure, yeah. <laughs> Way more of just single points of failure. What makes it distributed, in essence, with computing? At least two computers that aren't running on the same system, right? There's at least two of them that are working together. So what I thought I would do is, is draw out some of the aspects of distributed systems that make reliability something we have to design for. First of all, they're made up of autonomous agents. This comes from the, the REST literature. Where you, have, where you want to start assuming that the different systems are independently controlled and managed. And if you have autonomous agents interacting, then they have to have mutual trust. This is where reliability comes back to trust. If I trust Google's login system more than I trust making my own user table with the password column, then I'm gonna use their system, but it might not be there, right? So the other pr next problem with autonomous agents is there's uncertain outcomes. If I use a user table, it's either there or it's not there. If I call Google, I wait, it might work. How long do I wait before I give up? There's a third outcome, which is I don't know yet, <laughs> right? And this is, comes back to computing like CS 101 where we talked about the big O notation. The halting problem is, the, is there in distributed systems and it's not there in, in, in single systems, in centralized systems. Because we have a halting problem, we have three outcomes of every request. It worked, it didn't work, or I don't know yet, right? And what, what can we assume about the other system if it might have gotten our message? This is where REST systems have, have certain uh, useful grammar that we don't have time in this talk to get into that make, makes you be able to reason about the other end, even if you never heard back, right? Like a get call is safe. You don't have to worry about breaking something. Lastly, distributed systems have this reliability definition, which is uh, like when I asked, uh, my, my daughter came in yesterday and told me, uh, somebody ate all the yogurt. I'm like, I didn't eat any yogurt. And she's like, well, I didn't eat all the yogurt either. So some other person must have eaten, but we don't have any yogurt in the refrigerator, right? There, there's, there's this whole passing the buck. There's, somebody must have eaten, who's gonna, let's go ask the next guy until we get to the end of the line, right? Transitive reliability means, it means when somebody doesn't say the buck stops here. When some system depends on another system, depends on another system, and if that one breaks, if DNS breaks, how many people's apps are gonna keep working? You're all transitively reliable. If the power goes out, how long are you going to be up? Right? If, you're, if, you're, uh, if, if someone ransomwares your production database and it's all encrypted, how, how, how well is your application going to work? Your application always depends on things which depend on things which depend on things. That's transitive reliability. And if we want to be reliable, we have to do something about that. We have to stop it somewhere, right? So I told uh, Brian this would be the end of the preaching. Promises and expectations slide. When it comes to making reliable systems, this is sort of my idea of how we do it, is we recognize that we are making promises and we try to be explicit about them and that others have expectations of our software and we try to be explicit about those too and we recognize they don't always match. Sometimes you make a promise and someone expects something else. <laughs> and okay, maybe their expectation is wrong, maybe it's not, but when I go to the dry cleaner at 610 and they close at six and I walk in and they take my clothes, I'm pretty happy and I can rely on my dry cleaner, even though it was outside the SLA. The SLA was their opening hours, right? Nine to six. So sometimes you, you have to take both the promises that you're making and the expectations people have and meet both of them in order to be reliable. Uh, the next thing you gotta do to be reliable is you have to pay attention to if you're being reliable. That's monitoring, <laughs> because if you can't tell that you're actually failing, then you, are, you might be, and you're certainly not going to know if you're reliable or not. And if you don't know you're reliable, you're not reliable, <laughs> right? Um, then you have to have incident response. This is the mean time, between fa mean time to recovery metric. Uh, there's going to be automatic incident response, like on EC2 auto scaling groups, and then there's going to be in manual ones where you have your L1, your L2, your L3 response. And what you're trying to do is restore service quickly enough to restore trust in somebody's, in whoever's using your application. You're trying to get, to earn their trust by fixing it when it broke. I go a lot deeper on that on the security side, but <laughs> when, when Equifax messed up, they had a bad inc incident response system. And finally, postmortems. What's, what's postmortems? Anybody do those? You do those? What's a postmortem? It's a lessons learned. We get together as a group, 
And a guy named John Allspaugh promotes the idea of blameless postmortems because otherwise you never actually find out what happened. Because as soon as somebody said, I did it, you go, bang! And that's it. Now you don't get to know anymore about what happened. <laughs> so blameless postmortems need us to actually forgive and, rec and have people feel safe to say what actually happened because it's almost never an ind individual's fault anyway. It's your system's fault, however, whatever happens. So that's why we do the postmortems, to discover what was wrong with the way we do things so that the next time something bad doesn't happen again. Um, so much there, not enough to talk about. Let's get into what these tools are gonna do for you in Java. <laughs> so we want to fail less. That is one way to be reliable, right? There are more than one way. One of the ways is don't fail so much, right? Um, and there's kind of two kinds of failures there. There's, there's having an error when you didn't expect one, or there's taking too long whether you had an error or not. <laughs> that still ends up being a failure anyway. If I push on the gas pedal and my car doesn't go faster and then the light turns red, oh well. <laughs> I don't care if it worked now, it's too late. <laughs> you have to actually happen fast enough. That that's, it comes down to SLAs and multidimensional requirements. So the trick with failing less and with retrying things is you're adding the latency. So in order for anything that's gonna recover from failure to actually do its job, you have to fail fast. You have to give up quickly or for a, for a very small number of requests, don't do that, and then for the rest of the requests, use something that's gonna work. Or else, you're just slow and working, which is not working. <laughs> so errors and latency compound. The more retries you do, right, the longer it takes. <laughs> then, remember, something is better than nothing. In distributed systems, if you can give me back an error message where you might have waited 10 more seconds and given me a success message, I'm probably still gonna trust you better. Because especially if your error message says try again in 10 seconds anyway, then okay, I'll just try again in 10 seconds. Giving some answer is better than no answer. Anybody ever let a bill collector go to voicemail? <laughs> That's this. <laughs> At least picking up the phone and talking to the person is better than not even answering, right? Same thing with your web services, especially when they chain. If I got to call a web service, which calls a web service, which calls a web service, and the last one in line decides to sit there trying to figure out if it's going to work or not, all the rest have to sit there waiting right, unless they, do, they themselves do a certain kind of timeout. And then finally, you have to, this is a very subjective one, get humans involved at the right times. So monitoring and alerting systems generally have one of two problems, way too much information or way too little information, <laughs> right? Getting the right information, to, I, I, will, I propose, means finding out what humans need to do what and inducing them to do it at the right time and staying out of their face all the rest of the times. <laughs> Don't alert somebody unless they need to go do something about, some, about it and then tell them, do this, <laughs> instead of like stack trace, <laughs> email. Stack trace to email does not count. <laughs> so that's getting humans involved the right time. This is how you can fail less, right? You have to acknowledge you're gonna fail, especially in a distributed system. You can't help it if somebody cuts the fiber. It's cut, you know, you have to do something. So the, the, the tools we're gonna look at today all help us accomplish those objectives. So the preface to the whole thing is I decided to build this on Spring Boot because this was a fun project for the jug and I wanted to build it on Spring Boot, so I did. You're gonna see that. Um, in fact, if you checked out, if you cloned, I, I emailed the group, if you cloned the, the repo, um, I made some tags so you can see exactly you know, the process of building this. So this should rewind me to start. And all I did here was go to start.spring.io, I used the Spring Initializer, and I turned on all the libraries I wanted. That was it. And this is all, exactly what you get, nothing's changed. Um, you get a POM file, you get this project, it opens in IntelliJ, this is, or whatever you're using. And it's got, I decided to, I was making a back end for a smartwatch because I could just send JSON back. <laughs> um, so this smartwatch application is gonna give us the weather and like a little banner message or something that we're making for ourselves because we wanna have our own smartwatch background. Um, and it doesn't do anything as you can see. Right, so let's, let's go back. So Spring, Spring Boot does this much. It sort of puts all the stuff in place if you don't know what it is to make your application run. And you, it, it's, if you're new to Spring Boot, you're gonna discover it's alarmingly little code. Like you're like where every you add a little something and a whole lot of stuff happens. <laughs> so the, once you're used to it, you forget, and then you show somebody new, and they're like, "Hold on a second, show me the 55 things that just happened when you put that annotation." <laughs> Spring Boot kind of has this this 
this feel to it. So let me check out, um, well, let me go back to my slides first and show you what we're doing. So this is just a development framework for building an application. And the start tag just does that. That's it, it's getting started with an application. And then, let's talk about what Bain is. So it's the first piece of the Netflix stack, which is now not part of the Netflix stack anymore because it's open Fane, um, that I wanted to, to introduce. And this is just a declarative web service client. It's just a little tool to make it easier to call web services inside applications. So let's show you what Fane does. The only reason we, I used Fane here is that the other tools I'm actually trying to show you work really well with Fane. So Fane gives us a good starting point and we don't get tied up with web requests and stuff. So let me show you what Fane looks like here. And again, if you have the, oh really? What's it think I have? Oh, give me a break. <laughs> uh, that was weird that that happened. All right. So let's see what Fane did for us. So I wanted, I need, must have needed to call a web service or I wouldn't have needed Fane. Can pull it zoom? Oh, good. This little annotation basically says do magic, and it, it does all this Fane stuff that I'll show you. What I, was, what I was trying to call, I figured my smartwatch is going to show the weather. So I went and looked up on Programmable Web, and I found this Weather Unlocked API. Um, and to use it, I had to give it, send it a latitude and a longitude, and I had to register for an API key and some stuff. So in order to call it, I made in here a little client. And all this is is... You call it a Fane client, you give it a name, and you annotate, the, it's an interface, not a class, and you annotate methods and say, this is gonna be a get request, and here's the path I'm gonna call, and here's a little variable that I'm gonna stick into the path. And it goes behind the scenes and makes a class that implements that, and calls my API for me. So there's a little more magic to it, because you notice there's no, no host name or anything, so I wanted to show you here. You have to give it, and this ribbon thing is a sort of a foreshadowing. Uh, somehow you have to give it a URL, and I went ahead and gave it to it using ribbon, which is what we're going to see next. And then I had to configure some API keys and stuff. Those are not mine, but I have a local branch that has those in it. Um, and to tie it together, I had to make this little configuration thing. Um, and I did it all as, as static classes in here. So I needed to do a request interceptor to put the API key. This happens a lot with Fane. Um, and I, then I had to just make it use it. That's all that one is. Um, so that's what it takes to call an authenticated API in Fane. Also notice I made a class to represent the response. And I used JSON properties to, so that I could pull out of their API docs what I wanted. I only needed two things, which is nice. I didn't have to parse the whole object. If you go in here, you can see they've got a few more properties that maybe I, wait, down here, maybe I didn't want all of them. <laughs> I only needed two of those, so you only have to map the ones you want. Um, but Fane made that kind of easy. So my application kind of just talks about what it cares about and ignores the rest, and it works just fine. All right, so that's how we get it calling a web service. Great, it's not reliable yet. It'll break easy. Um, so let's see what happens to make it more reliable. First things first, let's talk about Ribbon. So what Netflix did is they introduced a client-side load balancing library. You've heard a lot about load balancers. Amazon has proxies, Nginx or HAProxy are also reverse proxies. You can install a little piece of software that your client, clients will call that and it'll call servers. And that way if a server goes down or comes up, it handles it. But what happens if your load balancer is down? Or what happens if DNS is down or something like that? What Ribbon does is it puts load balancing logic in the REST consumer. Whoever's right here in the same process that's calling out, you can give it a failback. Uh, you can give it as many fallbacks as you want with Ribbon, or you can use what we're gonna see on the next slide, other ways to know what are my choices. So I'm gonna call a web service, maybe I want more than one server I'm gonna call, and, and with the weather API, they only have one, but when you build microservices, you may have, for example, a blue and a green instance, and you wanna have it switch over intelligently instead of, when, instead of having errors when one goes down and then having it fail over. So, so Ribbon is the bit that tells the REST consumer, here's all the places I can go to go get my web, my web service that I need. So a client-side load balancing, that's the website, and that is not the spring version, that's the, the, the raw ribbon client. Um, so that, that's the idea with client-side load balancing, is let the client do its own redirection. Um, I 
I think that I do a ribbon tag. Let's see. I did not. So let me introduce the next piece that I wanted you to know, and then I'll show them both together, because ribbon and Heistrix work pretty close together. So before I get to Heistrix, I want to explain Eureka, because I didn't use it. Um, and Eureka and console are both, uh, my, I'm using console at work, so I wanted to try Eureka, but I haven't got it into the example yet. Eureka is Spring's answer to, Spring, to service discovery and service registries. So there's two pieces, there's a client and a server. The servers do their own clustering, so you could run Eureka servers in many different regions, even in more than one data center, and they will trade information about what, ser what services exist and how to get to them. And that's what the service discovery work is. So you set up your client, with a Eureka client, it connects to the re Eureka server that's local, and all those servers are doing the trading around of the information. You can both advertise services into it as a client, or you can consume, ask it for the, for the address of services. So it'll give you URLs, it'll give you um, host names, you, you can get uh, basically whatever you want to go look up a, the, right, the right service, almost always. In our case, you're gonna see it's host names. So that's what Eureka does. I did hard-coded server lists for the example because I didn't get Eureka working. <laughs> but uh, it would be an important part because your application could be up and running and other services can stand up and come down and your application is notified eagerly that they're there instead of having to wait and find out after they break. Without Eureka, you don't get that. Or without some service discovery system, you don't get that. Um, so Hystrix is the recoverability part. It's again from Netflix, you see the link, the link there. It implements the circuit breaker pattern. And this is just like at your house. Circuit breaker says, okay, something's down and we don't wanna keep sending thousands of requests per second to a down thing. So we're gonna just break this. Once we've, have, once we've exceeded a certain limit, we're gonna break the circuit and we're going to do some secondary idea instead. And your house, it usually means leave the lights off. But with our systems, maybe we can be a little better than leaving the lights off. We can cut to a generator or something, right? And that's what we're gonna see. So when it says latency and fault tolerance, Hystrix is sort of acknowledging what we started the talk with, which is something too slow is the same as something not working, right? So Hystrix and timeouts are very, very tightly connected. So you use Hystrix with, with uh, latency, SLAs, and, and then you tell it what to do when you have a fault. And then it has a little dashboard or a UI where you can go switch stuff back after it's fixed. So that's where I don't have the demo of the dashboard today. So that I do have a tag for. Check out Heistrix. Let's see what that looks like in here. So what you'll see has happened is on my weather unlocked client, I still have my weather unlocked client, but I've also added a Yahoo weather client. And my Yahoo weather client uses their RSS feed to go get the same two things, temperature and whether it's cloudy or overcast or something. Um, and then you'll see in my weather unlocked client, I've got this fallback attribute on my Fane client. So this is all tied together. This is Fane, right? Fane. But now not only do I tell it how to get to the weather service, I tell it what its fallback is. And whenever Heistrix kicks, it's gonna go down to this fallback. And this fallback, I auto-wired with the Yahoo Weather client. So now when it returns, when it tries to call weather unlocked and it has a problem, after a while it will kick over to this one. It'll give me this log message and then it'll go to Yahoo Weather. Um, and the Yahoo Weather client currently does not have any kind of fallback. So if Yahoo Weather breaks, we're still dead. <laughs> but you gotta have two weather services break or your whole network's gotta be down or something like that. Um, so I think, I'll show you it run, I'll, I'll run it at the end so you can see it. Um, because the next part, yeah, that's all the pieces I want you to, let me do the, the last. Um, version because what I did was add a one more fallback. So I figured, well, if Yahoo Weather's not working either, maybe all my API keys expired or something, I wanted a last fallback, and so I just made one that just gives some kind of answer. The weather's probably okay. <laughs> At least it's not gonna blow up and put a stack trace on my, my watch, right? <laughs> and it's always 75 degrees, because we live in San Diego, <laughs> or something like that. So we just wanted to, we wanted to do something, and obviously this is this this probably should do something like kick a message into Splunk or do this is where the humans need to get involved because we're down for our main main service and we're down for our fallback too. So this would be a good time to say help, <laughs> humans, please help me. So um, so to see this work, I think I can run this. Oh, this certainly will not work, but maybe that's okay because we're using fallbacks. 
It probably won't work because those are not my API keys. <laughs> I didn't want to put those in GitHub. But we're, we're restarting now. And I want to show you some of, the, some of the other settings in here. Where did they go? With Ribbon, there's a whole lot you can do, like how many retries, how many retries for the next server, what is the latency timeout here versus here. So the Ribbon has a timeout for when it falls, fails over from server to server, and Hystrix has its own timeout for when it cuts over to circuit breaker. Usually you'd want that one to be a longer one. <laughs> but um, there's, the, a whole, there's a whole bunch of articles about, which, about how to balance these timeouts to achieve a lot more complexity than you think. <laughs> so it's running, let's see. Let me do a little curl command. So I got today is August 14th, weather's probably okay. That sounds to me like I hit, well, I certainly did using fallback weather service. I hit my fallback. And if I do this, if I check out my local branch that has my right passwords on it, uh oh, and I just put those on a stream. <laughs> I may have to change those. Um, and restart the application. We've now had the human intervention. I went into production, I fixed it. <laughs> um, let me do that again. Oops. Do that again. No, I'm still getting the fallback. Why am I still getting the fallback now? Because I broke the URL. I wanted to see it break a number of ways. So now, there we go. So I've checked it in to GitHub. If you all cloned it, you've got a broken URL in there. <laughs> but I have the, the right one commented out. All right, let's try that one more time. There we go. So apparently it's hazy right now. That's what Weather Unlock says. Um, and that came from, came from Weather Unlocked. I have no way to tell if it came from Weather Unlocked or Yahoo, except I don't have good credentials in there for Yahoo, so I know which one it must have worked for. <laughs> um, so that's, that's the demo. Last thing I want to leave you with is a little message and then take some questions. So what can I tell you about Netflix and reliable software and REST services? Do we have it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the fallback class is just its own implementation of the, UR, uh, of the interface. The way I wrote it, I have two different interfaces for the clients. So if you, if you have, uh, the, the way some of the blogs do it, they have a parent interface and then they inherit for the different options of the service. So you're all dealing with the same interface and then you can just use a single fallback because they're all the same one. But since I use two different interfaces, I got stuck with two fallbacks. <laughs> but yeah, it doesn't have to be a chain. Um, in fact, I think the chain would probably be harder for ops to understand because they look like two services at that point. Yeah, when I say ops, I mean those poor guys who didn't write the code, but I have to take care of it. <laughs> yeah, Hystrix and Ribbon. Is that how you say it? I've been saying Hystrix. So, so Ribbon is going to, oh, repeat the question, thank you. Aaron Krauss, doing his duty. <laughs> Would you please explain the difference between Hystrix and Ribbon? So they're the two pieces I wanted, really wanted to maybe make the centerpiece of today, so you, I hope you get the difference there. Um, Ribbon is a client-side load balancer, so it doesn't do long-term circuit breaking. It'll just keep switching between the servers and the list. It'll, if, if, if Eureka brings it a new list, it'll load balance the requests across all of them in the list, and it'll knock stuff out of the list if its health check fails or if it detects for some reason that some of the servers in its list are no good. Um, where Hystrix, it doesn't know about a list of servers, it just knows about, you can give it not only REST clients, you can just give it spring methods if you want to and say that spring method is error prone and we're gonna call it a Hystrix command and we're gonna give it a fallback and it's gonna be that one over there. So Hystrix is made to have things break and stay broken and point to something else until something, whether it's code or a person, remedies the situation and flips the breaker back on again. And there's a UI for that. 
and I actually had a tab up of that I meant to show you, so good question there. This is, a, uh, this is my Hystrix dashboard that you can't see <laughs> because I didn't get it working, but the example Hystrix dashboard was useful too, so I can find it. Don't look at all my tabs. I'm not embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the dashboard? I actually have another, yeah, a lot of tabs. <laughs> I'm just going to do it this way. I do all the time. I've never seen them since. I'll just do it this way. This, is, this comes built in to Hystrix. Like, you, you just get it for free, and it shows you the latency and the performance of the different servers that Hystrix is watching and when the circuits are broken and when they're not. So it lets you come manipulate them too. Um, and this is just if you want to look directly at Hystrix. You, it also exposes them over JMX if you want to use some bigger enterprise monitoring thing and plug them into that too. How, he said, how does that all, that all that tie into Nagios? Right, or some, any monitoring. So Nagios will monitor JMX. It'll monitor REST. Hystrix has a, has a uh, it has a trap for SNMP also. So you can do, there's this thing called Hystrix Stream where it will output events and it'll pump them into Splunk or it'll pump them into whatever. I, I'm used to Sensu. I haven't used Isinga or Nagios in a million years or less, but it's been a long time. <laughs> um, so I, I haven't used it, I haven't used it with anything yet. This is brand new to me, but I know that they say they have uh, these, the JMX instrumentation, which, which to me says you plug it into all these different monitoring tools. Of course, every one of those has way too many metrics set up already, so you have to be very choosy. <laughs> um, do you have a way you say, do you using Nagios? Uh, or Sensu? What are you using for monitoring? Anybody? Monitoring? Hmm? Mm-hmm. So they have Splunk and App Dynamics, and they're exploring Dynatrace. They're using Hystrix dashboard, but haven't seen a lot of value directly just using that because it's part of a bigger set of stuff. And what did you say you use? Prometheus, Prometheus which is now part of Kubernetes. <laughs> I was surprised to hear that. Um, and that one is just, is it just, that's measuring things. It doesn't make graphs, right? So, using, So he says that you can plug it into many graphing frameworks. They're not worried about that. You're using the alert manager built into Prometheus. Yeah. And the what? The crappy graphs, the crappy graphs built in. I think it's Grafana. <laughs> but yeah. So, yep. <laughs> yeah, I w the, the time I would probably myself go ahead and use it right away is, oh, thank you. Can you give an example use case where you'd use uh, client-side load balancing? That was the question. Um, uh, yeah, so the, the, the main time I would use it, I do a lot of CI, CD, and DevOps. So for me, having uh, uh, canary deployments and incremental rollouts is something that makes people go to production more frequently and be less afraid. So I like to do it. I like to get stuff deployed a little bit, and then if it works, roll it out. Uh, client-side load balancer is perfect for that because you can have two versions of something up at the same time, and if one's down, it just won't route any traffic to it. So it'll, if, if it comes up broken, you're fine, right? And if, if you take the other one offline, you're still fine, and the clients don't have to be restarted or anything. Um, so if you think about using like a service discovery system with a client-side load balancer, it gives you a way to transparently upgrade back-end services without even touching the front-end services. So the question is, how is it different from having Apache or Nginx load balancing service? The question also comes up with uh, Amazon ALBs or ELBs or Google has their load balancers. The main difference here is that it's, since it's in the client application, you don't have an additional point of failure of the load balancer itself because it's in process with the client application. But then again, because it is, you can only use this one with Java. And if you're going to go use that Node.js, you're going to have to find another client-side load balancer. Or if you're going to use Python, you find one for that language. Um, so that's a trade-off.
Would client-side load balancing be better fit for thick clients than for thin clients? I actually, I kind of like it better for when I have a lot of clients, when I have tons of services that all have to find each other because they can all advertise into the same registry and find each other, right? And so I can take any one of the little services and swap it out for another one, and they're all fine instead of having to work my way back up the stack and restart them all after I've updated URLs and configuration files, right? Um, a big thick client, especially if I'm doing like, a, the, like an installation on a bunch of people's laptops all over the world, that also sounds like a good use case for it. But they won't be able to stay up with like a Eureka. Whoops. With, or be, be, mm -hmm. Did I do that? Yeah, and the Eureka client is getting eagerly notified by the Eureka server, just like with console. So it'll tell it right now that a new one is available, not wait until after it fails or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think the point was that it's also useful in disaster recovery scenarios, right? That you've got some, if you have two locations and you're gonna bring a cold spare online or an Australian version because the United States internet is a mess or something, <laughs> um, it'll, it'll re transparently redirect your clients to it. Um, and there's a really good, uh, another system we use a lot for that kind of service discovery, it's called DNS. So if you're using public clients and they can't all connect to your Eureka server or your console server, you could just use DNS for this, <laughs> and that's what it's for. You just put low time to lives, and they will find the new addresses as well. And I think Ribbon does work with multiple CNames. I just didn't get it working. <laughs> but I think if you just use DNS as your service registry, Ribbon knows how to load balance on the client side between the multiple IPs. I read that. I didn't do it. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Eager notification for one. He said, the question is, what does Eureka give you above DNS? Eureka, Console, and etcd, yeah, etcd is the one that Kubernetes uses, they all give you, and even Zookeeper, they give you immediate notification and you, like, you don't have to worry about stale information because it's going to be updated by the time you read it. Um, you can trust that what you get out of the service discovery system is all gonna be good stuff. Where DNS you have time to live. Sprint. Why does this remind them of a BitTorrent client? Probably because they do a lot of the similar stuff. I, I think service discovery is going to be similar, um, except you're, you're expressly using active-active, right? You're pulling from many at the same time. I don't think Ribbon will let you do more than one simultaneously. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's going to be that part about finding peers, right? Yeah. So I hope we walk out of here today a little more, more prepared to make reliable software. Uh, I think. It takes us to make it reliable, and I hope we go. I hope we all. Uh, I hope to see someone come in here and do one with Eureka <laughs> after this, because it's neat stuff. Thanks. <laughs>